Hey, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I want to share a framing because sex work is often so much more controversial than other even controversial topics. So I want to share a disclaimer about Force Detroit's approach and why we're having this conversation. Force Detroit is an organization that connects directly impacted people, um, that connects people directly impacted by violence, over criminalization, and criminal justice reform to legislators, public officials, and other stakeholders to create innovative, thoughtful change in partnership with these uh, directly impacted voices. Because this topic is so more sensitive than usual, I want to make sure it is clear that Forrest is not hosting this conversation to make a moral decision about what anyone does with their body. Instead, we're hoping to drive a conversation that focuses on the over-prosecution of women and girls and how all of our children deserve more economic opportunity, more freedom to make choices than what presently exists in our community. We hope to explore our conversation, look at where the criminalization is happening and focus on creating more opportunity. Um, the panelists have been given the freedom to express their personal views openly, um, not each other's and not the views of force or the Live Free Coalition. Um, so we're just asking that people use I statements to affirm um, that you're sharing your personal views and experiences and not debate, um, share judgment, or disrespect anybody in order to create a safe environment where people feel like they can share openly. Um, so, um, so let's go. My name is Alea Harvey Quinn. I'm the executive director of Force Detroit. Welcome. Thank you for being here, ladies. Um, I would love for each of you all to introduce yourselves and answer the first question about whether or not you believe there is a local, um, in the Metro Detroit area, a direct connection between schools and um, sex work or stripper poles. So the framing of this um, conversation is essentially based off of a series of articles that um, that said that there were local um, strip clubs shutting down because there were underage workers. And so um, many some of the teachers I have encountered, um, have shared that they that they have students that have engaged in sex work, and that that have, that has affected their ability to excel in school, and so we just wanted to open up the conversation. So, Parker, if you could start, then Misha, then um, Tierra, share a little bit about yourself and answer the question about whether or not you think um, this is an issue in Detroit. Taking it off first. Uh, I'm Parker Westwood. I am with uh, a network of sex workers to excite revolution uh, or answer Detroit. And as to the question of whether or not there's an issue of Detroit school systems leading girls into strip clubs or sex work, um, I did not go to school in Detroit. So I don't have a direct uh, experience in Detroit specifically, um, but I can't. I guess my perspective would be that it's a much broader issue than that. Um, that the criminalization of sex work and the um, under resourcing of not only girls in our schools, but um, the under-resourcing and lack of labor law in um, stripping in particular 
is part of the problem. There's a lot of stigma around stripping. And I think that uh, we're talking about two separate issues that play into the same systemic um, racism. Thank you. Oh. Uh, hi, my name is Misha Stallworth. I'm on the uh, school board for Detroit Public Schools Community Districts. Um, and so I think the first thing I want to say is that I think it's so critically important for women and especially black women to have power and autonomy over their bodies and over their sexuality and the ways in which they express their sexuality. I just, I just think that that is one of the most important things in the world, especially given the ways in which um, black women in particular are oppressed through sexual means that strip us of that autonomy and ownership. Um, and so um, when like kind of to Aaliyah's opening comments, you know, for, I want to say this without absent any stigma around the work itself. Um, I think that in any community where there are limited economic resources, folks are drawn to work where there's opportunities for um, under the table pay, um, where you don't have to deal with taxes, um, where there is flexibility in hours, um, and also to work that honestly is not as well regulated as some other labor because those that's the way in which it hits our pockets. That's the way in which we're able to, you know, kind of still live our lives the way that we need to um, in certain circumstances. I also think that the place where I would see a deficit in the school system um, has to do with one, a lack of education around sexuality in our bodies, um, a lot of which is not, you know, even at my level, there are state laws that restrict the ways in which we can take teach health class um, and the ways in which that we can engage in that discussion with young people. But even from the sense of like small business classes, right? You know, how many folks, if you're being hired as an independent contractor and a dancer, you know, what information do you need to know to protect yourself and protect your business economically? Um, and I think that a lot of times, this is where the stigma seeps in, right? Like we're, we're so quick to talk about tech or entrepreneurship in one space, but then we don't address the fact that a lot of this work, you also need some of that same entrepreneurship training so that you know how to, again, you know, protect your economics, protect yourself, um, you know, separate yourself from exploitive employers, things like that. Thank you for sharing that. Tiara, would you share next? And then, um, mm -hmm. Di, please correct me if I'm saying your name wrong. So, um, I'm Mazani, also known as Tiara. Um, Tiara is my real name. Mazani was my stage name. And I was, at one point in time, the number one entertainer in the country and out of the country global, international, national. Um, in regards to entrepreneurship in the adult entertainment industry, I kind of, I, I won't say that I sparked it, but I definitely will say that I was on the forefront of the revolution. Um, I'm from Detroit, but I lived in Miami. Uh, I, opened, I opened a beauty bar in Miami at 2013 2014 I was about 22 23 years old and upon opening that I began to understand that one um being exploited is a part of the game and we are all essentially playing the game when we enter the adult entertainment industry so um taking it to the school system um, I guess what we could say is that there are a bunch of little girls playing adult games. So when you take into consideration the fact that the mind is not developed until a certain age, when you look and you see the exploitation that's, that, that everyone is experiencing, you know, whether it's in the strip club, whether it's sex work, whether it's, uh, 
legalize prostitution. Like, it's a game that I don't feel that at any age you're equipped to play without knowing the rules. Um, stripping would be completely different if there weren't predators present. Sex work would be completely different if there weren't predators present. If there was no danger in these in these experiences, then it would be a different conversation. But I just want to be very clear that when we're speaking about in the, the entertainment industry that the strip club is so totally far removed from sex work that they don't realize that it's sex work. So I, I Parker, um, I looked at your profile and I see where you are and in and, 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 and your delivery of it, but it's not the same in the strip club. A lot of the girls in the strip club, a lot of the girls that do sex work don't even have respect for the girls in the strip club because they feel that it's easier. And, you know, it's, it's just a totally different dynamic. So I just want to be clear that the glorification of the strip club is why sex work isn't safe. The glory for the, 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 the not understanding that the strip club is a gateway to pimping. The, the strip club is a gateway to prostitution. The strip club is a gateway to um, sex trafficking, which is ultimately the biggest issue with children. I don't have a problem with adults doing whatever it is they want to do with their body. But when we're talking about kids, it's the glorification of sexuality and the glorification of sensuality that kind of puts me in a space where um, I don't really feel like there's an a, a equal playing field when there's no sex education in the school system. If I would have known that every time I have sex with someone, I'm connecting a part of me to them in the spiritual realm or emotionally, I probably wouldn't have had sex with the amount of people that I've had sex with. Now, as a as an adult, when you take oh, on, no. when you take, when you take and you say, okay, well, I'm an adult and I'm going to do what you want, that's totally different. But protecting the kids is the number one priority. So I think that the conversation should be how how are we constantly connecting the children with the sex industry? So let's in in the future. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, do you want us to call you Tier or Mazani? Mazani. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. I in the future, if we could all just uh, share our opinions without addressing the opinions of others, so that people feel comfortable sharing like controversial truths without. Um, feeling like they may not um, had a space to do so. Um, but thank you again. Zai, would you share your um, response? Tell us a little bit about Absolutely. you and, and whether or not you think that there is actually a school to strip a pole pipeline in Detroit. Okay, peace. Can everybody hear me? Fine. Yes, okay, awesome. Um, so my name is Zai Hopkins. Um, can you hear me now? I uh, went mute. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so excuse me, my name is Zai. I'm from the city of Detroit. Um, I am a current mother, first time mom, entrepreneur. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for the majority of my life. Um, I am also a former stripper. Um, I took on stripping later on, um, well into my twenties after I had had multiple experiences, um, in sex work and entertainment. Um, and basically, um, I found myself in a position where I needed to make some fast cash and I knew exactly where to get it. And I knew that it wasn't going to take much for me to get it. Um, so when we um, are talking about the connection between schools and stripping, this is actually, honestly, the first time that I've even heard of this pipeline. Um, so when I was asked to be a part of this forum, I, I 
did. Hold on one second, baby. Stop doing it too loud. Give me one moment, okay? Thank you. So um, when I was asked to be a part of the forum, I um, really started to think about it. And I feel like the lack of education, everyone spoke on, you know, we don't really have sexual education in schools. You know, we don't really have business education in our schools as we should. So when we're talking about what it is that's connecting the school to the stripper pole is really the lack of education. Me personally, I don't necessarily think that my pipeline was a straight pipeline, you know, like, because I wasn't thinking about being a stripper in school, to be totally honest, you know, like I was thinking about other dreams and goals and aspirations or who I was liking or whatever else I had going on. I really wasn't thinking about being a stripper, especially, you know, coming from a very strict Christian household and, you know, father's only girl, you know, like so baby girl complex, you know, so with that going on, it really didn't happen that way. But I do feel like there is a correlation. I do feel like it needs to be addressed. And that's really why I'm in the space today, to figure out what exactly it is that we can do that I personally, that I can do to bridge that gap. And, you know, what does that work even look like to make sure that there is not a school to stripper pole pipeline? Like, I don't even like saying that, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. So that's my take. Thank you for sharing. Um, how how do you want me to say your name? Talise, is it Talis? Can you unmute and share? Sorry about that. It's Talise. Talise, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Talise. I'm a real estate investment analyst in New York who currently lives in Michigan right now. I agree with everyone's point there is definitely an issue with young girls and I do think it has a lot to do with socioeconomics and the lack of sexual education in schools but I also think it has to do with the fact that our young girls um, they take in a lot of media and they are bombarded on a daily basis with all these images and all these women who are successful in their own right but you know, they are still women that are strippers and they are known for basically looking good, you know, like the Kardashians and the Cardi B's out there. And I do think that young girls start to idealize those people and they do see the glamour in it. And like Mazan, I think it was, um, I do think they don't understand that it is a game and that they're too young and ill-equipped mentally to handle that sort of game. And, you know, I started modeling when I was 16 and I was definitely, it's nothing like stripping. I, I wouldn't compare it to that in the sense that I wasn't equipped mentally, but it was also a situation that I feel at a young age, I grew up faster a bit because of the environment that I was in and I wasn't thinking it would be that way. So yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, so the first question, um, I'm sorry, uh, Force, can you turn down your volume so I don't sound crazy listening to my own echo, please? Hello? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so the next question is, there was an old Detroit Free Press headline that reads, Mom of, under, of Underage Detroit Stripper um, basically she, uh, implied that the clubs were handing out business cards outside of her daughter's school. Um, so the question is, like, I, I want to hear your reaction to that headline. And, um, if this isn't how young girls are getting recruited, how, uh, how do people, how are young girls uh, transitioning into that lifestyle. And please, anybody um, with experience, feel free to, to answer the question. Okay, um, I'm gonna go first. So personally, I had never heard of that uh, headline. I don't know what year it was, but I, I will say this. 
if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it. There's no need to pass out a card because, and, and that's not defending the strip club or the underworld at any, you know, at all. But the reality of things is there are more women knocking down the doors to become a dancer than there are women knocking down the doors to become a cosmetologist because again of the glorification so i don't really have a reaction for that headline but what i will say is um a lot of girls are attracted to what they see their friends doing and having older friends or having more experienced friends or having friends who are not your friends but they're recruiting you is kind of like a way that most of it happens. Um, I, I'll say that that's how I entered the uh, entertainment industry or the adult entertainment industry. It was lack of self-confidence, not really having the, the story of a bunch of friends. And then you get that one friend that's already lost and turned out and they're living this life or this facade of a life and they invite you in and you're already questioning whether or not you will ever have friends so it's just easier i think that a lot of times and why i feel like it's so important miss Quinn, to um create this this have this conversation is that when you're approached with it you never know how it's going to affect your life I can't lie. The game has been good to me. You know, like I, I like I said, I've tried, I've done all the traveling that, you know, one could want to do. However, I never glorified the lifestyle. I used to have tweets that would say, I don't glorify this lifestyle. I just live it. But not knowing that you're glorifying it by just living it is kind of like a double entendre. You're living it and you're showing the houses, the cars and the jewelry and things of that nature. And that excites young girls. So they one want to do it anyway and two word of mouth so i don't know i never heard of it never saw the headline sorry to that mother but um i, I think that it's more or less like your friends friend your kids friends your kids friends that then how did the some to somebody else um to give other folks an opportunity to speak um if how do you all think recruitment is happening or young girls get in the strip club and if their friend is already there is is not their friend the same age how does she get recruited i can't i can't speak to that level of specificity i think we we know that um you know there are predators who do not have a problem with like the sexualization of young girls um, what a couple of things I want to say about this article, though, and, uh, and about schools. So this article is from 2010, um, and I want to be clear that it, but it is was from, updated in in 2019. Yes. Oh, yes, I'm not implying I'm not implying that it's inaccurate or anything. What I was going to getting to is that at that time, the school district was under emergency management, and there are a lot of different things from the school district that have been cut from budgets, and so. What I would say from the perspective of like leading schools is that's literally like that's what security is for. That's what having parents involved in schools is for because it's the job of schools to protect children from predators to keep children safe. Um, and so if we're going to like if we're going to have this conversation about children and about youth development, I just want to be clear that any space where a baby is being dropped off for the day should be a space that is responsible for their safety, period. Um, and so I'm just saying at the moment that this happened, I acknowledge that there were a lot of things that were failing with the district at that time and look very different now. Um, and then again, I just think so much of this comes back to the socioeconomics of our city. I mean, our children take on economic responsibility for their families. They look for jobs. They look for opportunities to make money, whether it's for themselves so because their families are unable to support them um, or to contribute to the household income, right? Which is also a normal thing from youth development perspective, period, that teenagers seek independence, that they seek opportunities to um, assert their developing adulthood, even though they are not yet adults by any means, um, especially as it relates to consent for anything related to sex. 
Um, so I think that there is a part of this and, and that also makes those social things more susceptible, but far before, you know, glamour or anything else, it, you know, it is part going back to like a child's brain. <laughs> it is part of a child's brain to start seeking independence and finding that um, in economic opportunities. And then you layer on the challenges that we face in our city with supporting our families. And now it's like that much more critical to find something. So in Detroit, um, not to cut you off, sis, no, in that's Detroit, fine. 60 percent almost 60 percent of our children um the exact number is 57 percent of children are growing up below the federal poverty line 40 percent of adults so it's fair to say that um abstract poverty is a driving force of this um did anybody else want to respond to the headline Patrick? i would love to on to that if i may um there's a few things um and trust me, it'll all lead into the headline. Um, so I, I wanted to point out that the, even the, the title of this panel, um, School to Stripper Pole Pipeline, it reflects a school to prison pipeline, pipeline. And so there's like an inherent stigma even in the title of this panel that a job is equated to being in prison. Um, so I just, I just want to like point that out that like stripping is not the same as going to prison. Um, it is a job. And, um, and so I like wanted to point that out because that stigma is really important. It's that stigma that leads to the criminalization of other forms of sex work. Um, I also should have said earlier that I used to be a stripper. Um, and I, I, I did some stripping in Detroit as well as other places. And so it's like the stigma that leads to um, the lack of rights in stripping, um, a lack of bodily autonomy in a lot of ways, especially when managers are involved. I, the amount of managers that are trying to like do things that like we are capable of doing um, and like trying to take money away from the worker um, and the amount of clubs that are making it mandatory for you to use a manager, it was ridiculous. But it's, so the stigma, as well as the glorification, I do believe is, a, is an issue. Um, it's work just like any other job, right? So it, it has its like great moments, it has its awful moments. Um, I know people who love their job in sex work and hate it, um, loved stripping, hated stripping. I think I had days in like both places um, and still do have days in both places. Um, there's also like, in our culture, a lack of place for kids. Um, like we, there's just like, once you get to a certain age, um, all you, like there's a push to just grow up really quickly. And I think especially for girls, um, we're sexualized so early. Uh, and there's no place for like a preteen. We're just like striving to grow up so quickly. At six years old, I told my mom I wanted to be a stripper. Like a, a six-year-old has no business like uh, aspiring to that. Um, and not that it's like a bad thing, right? It's just like, where, wa where was I allowed to be a kid? Um, so I think there's, a, there's something to be said about stigma and then also allowing our kids to be kids. Um, and so we have to be aware of this stigma um, and, and criminalizing parts of sex work because it leads to more dangerous workplaces because sex work is criminalized um strippers are are seen as close to that and and seen as less than less than um and our their career places like I, when i worked there the amount of money i had to like divvy out like the money i make the amount of money i had to like tip out to people and get like I didn't have a manager, but I could have been paying out a whole lot more money. And sometimes girls ended up in the red, like meaning they didn't make any money for the night because they tipped out so much or had to pay the stage fee. Their strippers have so few rights. Um, so I think there's like, again, it's like two separate issues playing into one another. Like we, there isn't a place for young girls. And so they're striving uh, to grow up too quickly. And then there's also this stigma of sex work 
that makes work the workplace entirely unsafe and allows for predators like that to hand out cards at a school place. Like if there were labor laws in place and that were enforced for strippers and sex workers alike, that probably wouldn't have happened. Um, yeah. So thank you for sharing. I, I love because you hit so critically on criminalization. I, I want to feed you another question. And then that is, is there a connection between stripping and human trafficking? And um, after you answer it, I would love to hear from uh, Zai or Talise. I hope that's it right. Who? Okay. Um, who we've yeah. heard from little. So is there a connection between stripping and human trafficking? Um, I want to make a clear distinction between human trafficking and uh, voluntary sex work. Whereas like human trafficking involves an element of, of coercion. Um, and we could make the argument that like under capitalism, we're all coerced to like, quote, like have to work for money under in some way, but like, like more um, trafficking involves a more like direct and, and nasty form of like coercion, like someone forcing you to do the work um, or convincing you to do the work against your will. Whereas, um, sex work uh as we know it um uh, like voluntary consensual sex work involves the consent and bodily autonomy like of a human being deciding to do that work of their own free will so does stripping um lead to human trafficking without the rights without labor law in place without ensuring that we have a safe work environment for strippers and prostitutes as like as we know them in the law um like words of the law but sex workers as as they generally like to be called um as we generally like to be called sex workers also need these same kind of rights um because without decriminalizing sex work on the whole we're making anyone who's like near to it m more at risk um strippers so i don't i think like it's a yes and a no like um yes because sex work is criminalized in the united states it, it makes all forms of sex work more dangerous and um yeah more apt to like touch sex work in that way if Thank that makes you. sense yeah it does uh zai talise do you all have something to Say, I'll pass it back if not to Mazani. Um, yeah, I'll I'll share. Um, I feel that the entire adult entertainment sex working industry is all connected. Um, it's all interconnected. It's like a big spider web. Everything can lead you to this. That can lead you to that. That can lead you. To there that you can meet someone who this you back over here um so it's all connected do i believe that a young woman or older woman a woman in general in a strip club can be coerced into believing that she can have a better life if she does something else absolutely absolutely most individuals who, most of us who enter into those situations, if you were anything like me, there was a plan of some sort. There was a goal. There was a dream. There was something you were trying to obtain, something you were trying to get, whether it was material, whether it was emotional, whatever it was, you were trying to obtain something. So if you reach a point inside of that work where you may feel like you've plateaued, or like you are not achieving those goals or you look around where you planned on being here for a year and it's six years later and you're still here. Can you be coerced into possibly ending up being trafficked? Absolutely. Um, I think that we've already discussed and talked about how most individuals who enter into this world aren't um, mentally ready. 
um, aren't prepared for that. So it's a lot of vulnerabilities circulating around there. You know, it's almost a swimming pool of vulnerabilities. And if you know exactly what to look for, and if you are spending time in these places, which, you know, we speak about predators, you know, that's what, that's what professional individuals do. They figure out what to say, how to say it, how to make it work in their favor. So um, I definitely believe that it's absolutely um, possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I guess I'm up next. Uh, I wouldn't say I, I think that uh, sex workers working in the sex industry or in the entertainment business necessarily leads one to sex trafficking because sex trafficking is never a choice. Um, what I would say is that I think that it makes people that work in that type of industry more susceptible to those kind of predators. Um, speaking from firsthand experience, um, when I was 17, I went out of the country for the first time on my own. Um, I've never traveled before, but I traveled for work and we all went to Europe, to Paris, and I came this close to a sex trafficker when I was out with friends. Um, she was a female, she was very close to my age. Um, she was very friendly to me, and basically she tried to get me to go away with her, away from my friends outside. Um, I'm not really sure what it was about her that made me really uncomfortable, but in the end it turned out to be the right decision to follow my gut and not go with her. Um, but I don't think it necessarily leads to it, but I do think that, you know, young women are ill-equipped. They don't. How are you? Know. you I'm, I'm sorry. I feel like you just touched on something that's really, really important um, because she was a woman, right? That was a recruiter. Mm -hmm. And then like, yo, how do you identify them? So like, the, Misha, the next question is, and you've already answered this, but I would love to hear from you. How do, um, beyond just security, what are some things that we can teach our young people? What are some ways that the school system can show up? But first, I want you to tell me how you identified her um, as a potential human trafficker. I, I didn't know it was she there weren't any telltale signs except it was just intuition that kicked in she was a bit too much she was a bit too friendly and I'm a smoker I smoke cigarettes I'm smoking at that age and um, she was pressuring me to have a smoke outside with her when we could smoke inside and it made me question her and um, yeah, there's just something strange about her, but she was totally normal. At first we were having a good time hanging out and I didn't suspect anything weird about her until that moment that she was pressuring me. And because uh, when we arrived in Paris, they educated the girls and told us to be on the lookout for traffickers. Mm -hmm. So I guess my antennas went up because they warned us, but they didn't necessarily, I'm here thinking it's going to be a guy that grabs you into a corner not a yeah. girl that's close to my age that's in the same environment as me having a good time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, there was an article that came out um, that suggested that most of the traffickers were, um, were women um, and peers. Um, Mazani, before we pivot to Misha, did you want to add? Hell yeah. Look. My bad. So look. I should have known. <laughs> be your own people. And I'm not exempt from that. It like, the reality of things is that things happen so fast. I'm not talking about people intentionally putting you in a line of fire or like people like saying, oh, I'm gonna traffic you. It's you at a party that you're dancing at with your home girl. And one of the guys is like, well, we just threw this certain amount of money. Somebody has to come up out of some vagina. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it be, and, and like I said, I'm not exempt from that. I'm not, I'm not innocent from that. I'm not saying, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that there's never been a time where I've been some, or, 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 or someone has been with me and they may have felt uncomfortable because I remember when I realized that something had happened to me, the, the, and, and I, I don't want to make this religious because it's not, but the Holy Spirit revealed to me something so serious, the amount of times where girls have felt pressured. Damn. I had to go back and apologize myself to girls. I got mad.
messages when when I went through my transformation when I tried to go to Africa and I wasn't aware of the amount of things that go on abroad because I've been to London, I've been to Dubai, I've been to Jamaica, I've been to Bahamas. I'm not aware, I'm not awake, I'm not conscious, I'm not paying attention, none of that. But I'm trying to go to Africa and I'm a pastor's kid so naturally I'm snatched up and unable to go and that's why I'm able to sit on this panel and say it's never it, 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 I won't say it's never a man but nine times out of ten that man has someone that has been down for him for so long that the conversation is going to be so easy you're not even going to know you're not even going to see and you're going to be a victim like it's it's rarely a man that you see it's almost always a woman that you feel some connection to. A woman that you feel like we may have some things in common. We may have be, be able to have a conversation. I'm not speaking from something that I don't know. I'm speaking from experience. I'm speaking from, from, from at one point in time having to repent for being the girl that put the girl in the, in the position. No, nothing sexual happened to her, but just being uncomfortable is traumatic. Yeah. Being uncomfortable, being put in an uncomfortable situation is traumatic. Yeah. Being put in a, in a situation where even if you say no and nothing happens, you're questioning the person that you came to the event with because they don't see anything wrong with the pressure. It's the pressure. Yeah, yeah. And it's not peer pressure. It's not pure. It's because I was I was I was spiritually dead at the at the time, so I'm not placing blame. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it's always a woman. Watch out for these women. Can't trust women. What I'm saying is, a lot of us women are so have so much feminine energy that we don't even realize when we're finessing each other. When we don't even realize when we're putting each other in those situations where we don't know whether or not we want, would want to be in them. Where we don't know. And then let's be clear, industry, going from industry to industry is a thing. I can't imagine, and sis, I told you this the other day when we was on the phone. I can't imagine having been on TV without recognizing the trauma that I experienced in the adult entertainment industry. So they shift you from the strip club to the TV screen without first allowing you to understand the trauma that you've experienced. Yeah. So you don't know who to blame. Yeah. You don't so know who gonna, did it. We don't come back to that because we need solutions. So signing that's we what I'm here for. I want to talk about the solutions. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Let's dig into them. But first, Misha, um, how can the school system, like, like, I mean, if we're talking about, um, so the research suggests that our brains aren't fully developed until we're 25 right? That's, that's the, the legit research, right? Now, by that time, we can have sex, we can go to war, we can drink, we can smoke, we can do all the things. Mm -hmm. but, if, um, but if we're talking about like young girls who, who, are in, who are school age being enticed to this, um, what, what are some of the mechanisms that the school can provide like outside of just security? Yeah, yeah, and I want, and I, you know, I was speaking to parent involvement and security. I was speaking to all the ways. Yeah, that yeah. yeah. Um, but so also, our brain finishes developing at twenty five. The last thing to develop is impulse control. So just for folks who are interested in that, it's not like we are twenty five and can't function or think all the way. It's that we still are incredibly impulsive up until twenty five. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, I think going to some of the themes of this conversation, when we talk about glamour, when we talk about marketing, you know what I mean? You're still highly susceptible um, as, you're, as you're aging, even into your mid-20s. Um, but schools are communities. Schools are not just administrators and teachers and, and students. Schools are also parents. Schools are also volunteers. Schools are other staff members who are there. Schools are custodians and noon hour lunch aides and all of these different individuals that come together 
um, with a purpose of educating our children and preparing them for, you know, life as adults. And so I think that it's the responsibility of schools, yes, to keep them physically, emotionally, mentally safe, but also to enrich children. Um, and quite frankly, especially as we're having this conversation, which I do want to throw out that there is also a difference between sexual assault and sex trafficking. Um, although sex trafficking is, a, I mean, sexual assault is a part of sex trafficking. Um, Parker and Talisa are probably way better at like actually putting the specific definition out of sex trafficking than I am. Um, but a lot of it comes back to how we embed ideas that women do not own their bodies. And that when we, in, and then when we start interacting with money and the exchange of money, it reinforces the idea, oh, now I really don't own my body. But no, you still own your choices, you still own your body. And it comes down to things as simple as dress codes. Um, and this is one of the reasons that I'm, I'm very passionate about like our student code of conduct. I'm very passionate about um, dress codes because a, a young lady will walk into a high school building in leggings and immediately have comments about her body and whether or not her body is appropriate right? And that's still a child. So what we should be having conversations about is, is this supposed to be a professional space? Is this supposed to be a casual space? We're not supposed to be having conversations about her body in that way, um, especially with the undertone of, well, who's going to be looking? Because again, it's a child. And, and this happens at middle schools. I think we, I'm sure that we have all engaged with it, that we've all seen it. Um, you know, we've had discussions about whether or not shorts should be included in uniforms, right? And we know how hot it gets, right? And, you know, you can make the shorts as long, it's, it's already a uniform. Uniform shorts are already regulated length. So what are we even talking about? Why does it matter if a, young, if a girl has on shorts versus a boy? Mm -hmm. um, and so while I, I, I reject the idea of a school to stripper pool pipeline, um, the school to prison pipeline has to do with how schools every day in many places have been structured to look and feel like prison from police involvement all the way to, you know, um, the emphasis on compliance, right? You don't have stripping normalized in schools in that way, but you do normalize that young girls don't own their bodies that they should always be concerned about how their bodies are shaped and how they're moving and kind of to what Parker said, like just allowing girls to be girls and holding adults responsible for adult things. Um, and so for me, when I think about, again, the school community, it's making sure that parents are able to be involved, do have opportunities to volunteer, do have opportunities to, uh, you know, be hall monitors. It's it's principals that know the names of every single one of their students that know who's here. It's having, you know, mental health and emotional support within the school building so that students who are going through things have people to talk to, can work through their decisions. Um, it's also having access to referrals and resources for families that are going through economic strife. Like who are we partnering with to make sure that our families are healthy? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing. Um, the next question is, um, in this same article that I referenced earlier, it says the mother of a 15-year-old girl um, this year, which is, as we know, it's an older article, says club owners and managers preyed on her daughter and are to blame for the illegal activity. Detroit police took the teen into custody Monday after they found her dancing at the club um, and padlocked it where she was and padlocked a different club where she was caught in April, a previous month. The girl reportedly told authorities that she danced at a total of four clubs. So, um, so I guess my question is, the police took the girl, the response was for the police to take the girl, right? Um, how should this be handled? Like, how can we, um, when, when, a, when a girl makes a decision to strip, how should it be handled? Are the parents responsible? That came from our audience. Who, how to, how, how old is the girl? Uh, she was 
15 in this article. Is this the girl whose mom was later on found out to have been taking her to the club and dropping her off? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just asking theoretically. I'm using this as an example to ask okay. um, whether or not this. Um, well, everybody can involved handle. has to. So, so right. everybody. How, how can we not lock up people? How can we yeah. support and not lock up people? So this is, I think around, if, if this is 2010, this is around the time that the stuff happened to all stars or whatever, but there's a, a license that you're supposed to have, a cabaret license that you're supposed to have. And there are a lot of things that you have to do to get this cabaret license. You got to go get a clearance. You got to, there's a lot of things that you have to do to have this license. So ultimately, I believe that the club should be responsible because one, you're letting this girl in without a license. Two, if we are independent contractors, which we are once we cross that threshold, um, I, it, this is why I say two, because if you're an independent contractor, then the club is responsible for your safety because they are, they're responsible for the building. You're responsible for yourself. The club is responsible for the building. So if I go to a club and a pole falls, the club is responsible because that's a part of the building. Now the parents should be responsible because, and, and I don't want to be too harsh with this because honestly, the parent might've been working two, three jobs, maybe a single mother. We don't know the situation or the circumstance, but I feel like the club should be responsible and the parents should be responsible. The young girl is definitely responsible, but she's also um kind of like in this space of just trying to find herself and i'm not making no excuses for her however the parent in the club is definitely responsible the club more so than a parent in my opinion i would love to speak to this if i may please and then i'll i'll go after you but go right ahead well thanks say um yeah so i think this is there's there's so much here um i think that i want to take a minute and zoom out um, a little bit um, and look at the bigger picture here because there's there is a lack of resources that is um, driving the need to to do this work um, is what it's what it seems like and in my experience that was true I needed the money and so I sought out the work that would get me the money um, and I worked multiple jobs and stripping was one of them right um, so like within capitalism like, let's be real here. The game we're playing is capitalism. It's not just like sex work, it's capitalism. And the way we're choosing to play the game is as a sex worker, um, whether that's stripping, whether that's prostitution, whatever it may be. So in this particular circumstance, it's it always breaks my heart when someone enters the club at like 15, just because like I entered at 19 and it's a lot. Um, it's just a lot because you're not protected in a lot of ways. Like sure, as an independent contractor, um, the club is responsible for the work environment, which is usually not that great. Um, they do the bare minimum to make the most money off of your talent, um, like our talent as workers. Um, also as independent contractors, we are responsible for paying our own employment tax. like not only our own taxes, but like the employment tax as well. Um, and then the, don't even get me started on the cabaret license. That was like, it's such a slut shaming journey to get your cabaret license, the amount of fees you have to pay, the, um, the way that the paperwork is written. It says like um, something about like sex, in sex industry, something, something, and you have to get it um, notarized. Um, so I'm like at my bank uh, doing the whole thing where it says like to be working in the sex industry. Um, it's just like a whole journey of like exposing what you're doing to the people that you interact with on a daily basis. But so it's like I have a hard time being like the parents are responsible, right? Because there's obviously a resource need here. Um, I think the like on the whole, if strippers and sex workers had the respect 
um, dignity and therefore the labor rights. Like if our work was actually seen as work, I'm, I keep coming back to labor law because I, I find it so important. Like we deserve the rights to not work 16 hours in a row. Um, like the pulling, a, like pulling a double was a thing that like I did and I saw girls do often, like pulling long shifts in order to like walk out of there making money that evening um, or that day in that case. Um, I, it just comes back to labor law where it's like, she should have never had that job if she was 15 years old. Um, and yeah, I guess, I guess I'll end there because my brain is trailing off, but um, thank you. Thank you. Zai, did you want to hop in? Yep, I can hop in. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say this young lady was failed on multiple levels. Multiple levels. This is what we can go ahead and call a structural issue. I can only speak on the Black community because that's the community that I'm a part of and that I operate in. Um, I've operated in um, some white communities as well, but I'll go as far as to say the community, the white community that I was raised in, I think there was one strip club and it was like laughing stock of the city. So if that can paint a picture of how that went. But when we're talking about this young lady, you know, she's 15. I'm sure she was beautiful or is beautiful, gorgeous, you know, and being in a position where she was accessible for whatever reason to an individual who had money and power, I'm sure, or was able to show a sense of money and power and was able to, in some way, shape or form, show her a better life. If you come with me, your life will be better in some way. So whatever is happening in your home, whatever is happening with where you are, in school, whatever it is, clearly that's not enough and I have something better for you. Then she was able to actually become a part of the industry. And like, just, just thinking of it, it's like, you were able to, like, I think about my first day, you were able to get clothing to wear. You were able to come up with a name. You were able to enter into this space as a woman, you know, and who knows what type of psychological trip that was for a 15 year old woman, young woman to be in that type of position, like psychologically, like what that was able to do to her. So personally, it's everybody's fault, you know? Like if we're, if that's what we're, we're if we're really trying to, to place and point, feet, point fingers, it's my fault, you know? It's for, for, for making conscientious decisions to glorify this behavior. It's, it's the men in the community's fault for making it seem like this is where we need to go to get this type of cash. It's the manager's fault for flexing his power in the way that he did. It's, you know, the, the family unit was not strong enough, you know? So then if we're talking about solutions and how do we fix that, we gotta get to the root of the issue. And the root of the issue is, as many of the individuals on this panel have talked about, lack of resources mm -hmm. is lack of access. Most of, most of us don't even know what we can possibly do with our talents and with our God-given talents, not just our beauty, but with all of, all of the tenacity, all of the resilience, all of the brilliance. We don't even know what we can do with those because unfortunately, programs are getting cut in schools. Music departments are being shut down. Sports are no longer an option. So if you're leaving young women with only our features to get us to the next level, yes. You know, at one point I wanted to model and sometimes I still do, you know, but they weren't paying as much for me to be in front of a camera. You know what I'm saying? So we gotta work on 
the resources. We got to work on making sure that our, our young men and our young women have access to other opportunities and not just to make just any money, to make good money, just to put that out there, to make good money. Because there are 18, 19, 20-something year olds who have real life responsibilities, real goals and dreams. So McDonald's isn't going to cut it. Fast food isn't going to cut it. You know, so we need we need more resources. Sis, can I say something based on what she said? Of course. Okay, so I want to, my battery is long, I'm going to really try to get to a charger. But, okay, so him, when she said that the school to prison pipeline wasn't justifiable or it was um, basically uh, passing judgment or something of that nature, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm walking to on bubble gum and all of the above. But what I will say is that all of this stems from systemic oppression, okay? When you think about one of the first dancers, Madame Noor, she wasn't even a dancer. They treated her as a circus freak, okay? Mm -hmm. So when we speak about psychological issues, this stems from slavery. The resources and or lack of resources stems from slavery. The, the, strip, the, the five strip clubs on eight mile versus, and, and only two of them are Caucasian. And then let's be very clear, the black strip club and the white strip club is two totally different dynamics. The black strip club is where you get to make it rain and, they, and a disrespectful ass DJ. That's what you get in the, in the, in, in your, and you're called every name in the book in the black strip club. In the, in the white strip club, which I've never been able to dance at, you know, um, there's a level of respect that we don't get in the black clubs. So, and that's, that's, that's Miami, Tootsies versus King of Diamonds. You know, that's Detroit, Trump, Penthouse versus Ace of Spades and All Stars. It's a different there's a difference. And, and, and as my sis said, I speak on the black community because that's the part of the community that, that that's, that's what I am. That's who I am, that's what I know. So what I do know is that the difference between a 15 year old white girl choosing to be in the entertainment industry and a 15 year old black girl choosing to be in the industry is that the 15 year old black girl was one, let down way before she was even in her her parents' womb. We're like, let's get deep here. If we're gonna if, if we're gonna get deep, let's get deep. This is who we are. We have been sexualized our entire existence. Madame Noir died at 26 years old from syphilis sitting in her body from traveling all over the world. So I can't sit back and say that it's, it's, it's not the same. We've been sexualized and kids are being sexualized and it's not okay. There is no comprehensive understanding as to how, like I'm ready to get to the solutions. My phone box and I need to get to a charger. But listen, if we're, we, can't, we can no longer complain about resources. We have to be the resources. We have to be the resources. Um, there's something yeah. that I really didn't want to lose in this question, Aaliyah, and I know, I know you have a no, program. Please, go ahead. But I really don't want to lose the fact that 15 is a child, yeah. uh, that I don't care if teenagers can drive. I don't care if teenagers are independent. I don't care that 15 is a child. Um, labor laws do protect children, right? So in that case, it's not labor law that's to blame. It's all the people who are supposed to be enforcing those laws and those regulations, right? Um, even to the extent that you can't even be an emancipated minor until you're 16. You can't work at Kroger without a permit signed by your parent, right? Unless you join a you know city, like a special program that is for youth employment. Um, and so I think when we read these stories and we hear about 15 year olds who make all of these grown decisions, sometimes we lose that they are children. Mm -hmm. um, and so when Zai says that she was failed on so many different levels, I think that that's really critical because it is adults who are responsible for children, um, that it, it, point blank period. 
So, you know, if, if the parents were ill equipped to be responsible for this child, you know, then there's no judgment to them. It's just a matter of finding other adults who are equipped to be responsible in some way, shape or form, whether that's a mentor, you know what I mean? Another family member, whatever it is, but you know, we as adults are responsible for our children. Okay. Um, thank you for that. So, um, in law. So, um, I think what's painful about this, what's particularly painful about this conversation, um, and Mazani was about to hit the nail on the head, is that so many, um, so many Black women and girls statistically don't get to choose, right? More than, more than any other um, constituency, Black women and girls are victims of rape, molestation, um, all types of victimization. Um, and the question, you know, the question that all this conversation is, is driving to is what are some concrete structural solutions? And as Sus said, how do we show up as the solutions? So I've got a list of things that you all have been saying that I want us to unpack what it could look like. Um, Cause that's exactly why Forest Detroit is here. Um, so what, what I've heard is um, mentoring. I've heard um, job creation clearly at a high level because we are not talking about replacing high paying jobs with um, McDonald's, that was clear. Um, I heard parent integration into the schools and I heard um, the, the increase of advocacy work and law. Um, what if we were dreaming and um, we were able to snap our fingers and create a change uh, that can make other women who were in the same situations as you less vulnerable, what would that change look like? What would we be fighting for? What should what what should we be fighting for, y'all? Um, anybody feel free to speak. I'm big on starting with personal responsibility. I'm 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 real big on that. Um, and I mean that to the extent of I cannot remember how many girls I went to high school with that were dating boys in their 20s, right? And I think it is a normalized experience. Other women that I talk to have had this same experience, right? And so it's like, as we learn more and embrace more the reality that, again, children need to be protected and need to be children, right? It's up to us to call those kinds of things out, right? You know, many of us even have friends, right, who are still talking, you know, in a sexual manner about young girls. Oh, she's going to be this or she's going to be that at this point, you know, all of that. It's not cool. And so I think that starting with that personal accountability of, and, and actually Mazani was talking about it. She was talking about how she went through her own personal internal, internal growth and went back and reconciled and now is trying to make sure that she's you know, passing on that information. Like we all have to do that because it is so normalized. Um, other areas that make sense, like when we talk about jobs, if your teenager or a teenager you know is braiding hair, pay her what you would pay the salon, right? If, if, if your teenage boy is cutting grass, pay that boy what his time is worth because these are the lessons that we teach about being paid what is worth for our labor and the lessons that we teach about entrepreneurship and the lessons that we teach about running your own business. Um, because again, if we talk about it, not just from resources, but like seeking economic independence, there are lessons that we can teach. I'm sorry, Lee, were you about to say something? No, so I think the thing that strikes me, um, obviously I'm a woman, right? Like I've been raped before. Um, I've, I've not experienced what some of you sisters have experienced, but um, but I think what um, strikes me is that 
there is all this opportunity to grow, to transform, to heal. There's a whole criminal justice reform industry. And yet for this uh, industry that's highly criminalized, it's just like, go to church. Let's just pray. And then we're, and then at the same time, so many people are complicit with like ignoring powerful people's um, inappropriate sexual behavior when they're, um, when they're uh, targeting, especially younger uh, girls. So, so yeah, I guess what I'm looking for is like structural solutions, right? I, I think it's important to teach the value, right? I think it's important to, to, to teach um, that we should value individual hair braiders, right? I think it's more important to create, um, to create a, a job center that targets girls the way we target guys who uh, might otherwise be going into prison, right? Um, which is why I created a parallel in the framing, just because there are options. There's a whole sector of work, a whole criminal justice reform sector, but there is uh, no option to heal and transform and and grow if you're you're seeking to transform from this. But there is an opportunity to go to prison. Yeah, I'm gonna be quiet. So somebody else can respond. I just want to. I totally agree with you. I like to start with what, like, if I woke up tomorrow, what could I do? You know what I mean? For And yeah. then build it. Yeah. And I appreciate that value. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'll go ahead. I, that was wonderful, Misha. Yeah, I, I like to come from the same space. You know, um, me personally, I try to figure out, you know, what can I do? Like, once I learn a lesson, what can I do to add value? You know, you know, back, back into there. And I think... Um, Speaking to your point, Alea, I have a lot of male colleagues that travel to schools and speak to men, speak to young men, and, you know, they hold these uh, large talks and auditoriums, and, you know, they are, they're engaging with them, and I don't see a lot of women in those spaces and you know they've actually you know talked to me you know like z you know we we need more women you know there's never anybody to talk to the young women so i feel that part of my personal work in my journey is you know first of all we have to have those uncomfortable conversations that allow us to own what our stories are you know a lot of times when we talk about trauma inside of the black community there are so many taboo topics that we don't speak on and these things just fester inside of us and they turn into predatorial behaviors and they turn into um acts of of you know lack of self-love you know towards us towards ourselves so I think that we need to, I love that this safe space was created. This is actually the first time I've ever been in a space in this way. And I feel so blessed and humbled to be able to be in a space where I can share with young women what that really looks like, you know, what sex work looks like, what stripping looks like, what type of, um, what you can expect, you know, what type of psychological warfare are you going to be fighting every single moment while you're in there, you know? So I think that um, it's important for, for us to go into these schools, talk to these young women, go to where they are, you know, and make sure that we're bridging those gaps, you know? And I think that at the end of the day, every sex, sex worker and stripper wanted some money. You know, and for me, my um, entre entrepreneurial spirit was sparked by the industry. Now, if I had another outlet for that, you know, personally, I didn't really come from um, a family that talked about multiple income streams. I never learned about residual income until I was an adult. 
you know, so there were things that I feel, you know, could have been talked to me about, you know, as a young girl, like you can start your own business. You don't have to work for nobody else. Just like you set your prices in the club, you can set your prices for whatever it is that you want to do. You can create things. What do you like to do? You know, you like to paint? Cool. We can sell your art. You know, there are so many other things that we can do. So I think that it's important that we have to go and talk to them. We have to go and have these uncomfortable conversations. You know, we have to get over these stigmas we got to show up for forums like this you know we have to it may take you know building that relationship I don't have any relationships with individuals with any you know schools or anything like that but it takes going outside I mean if you really want to do the work it takes going outside of your comfort zone building those relationships and finding the young girls you know to, to talk to so that that way we can start the healing you know there because unfortunately we kind of owe, you know, so we got to work yeah. on healing, you know, in different ways, you know, we have to work on that, but we can still go back, you know, and pour mm -hmm. that into our young women and our young men. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing. Parker wanted to share next. Wow, y'all. There's so much here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do like a zoom out, zoom in thing again, where like, because the so like what can we do um what can we do there's so much at play here um i also want to um touch back on what nizani had said where like it is it is a racism based sort of thing because capitalism and white supremacy have like worked hand in hand for so long um there's a reason that seven times more black women than white women are charged with sex work with specifically prostitution charges there's there is a reason why the laws are the way they are and it's because they are racist the criminalization of sex work is not only sex with sexist because a lot of women are successful in an industry making money in an industry so of course it's criminalized but it's racist because who's getting criminalized not really the white women doing it, mostly the black and brown women, and especially the black and brown trans women. Um, so yes, it's racist, um, but the criminalization doesn't serve anyone, especially the black and brown community. Um, and so when we like zoom out a little bit and we're talking about bodily autonomy and resources, um, we can work to provide resources to communities. So a universal basic income or a raise in the minimum wage so that people don't have to work multiple jobs or these like higher paying jobs um, that are that come with more risk, right? Um, universal health care, because I don't know about you all, but I have some in, like crazy bills um, to pay that are that have to do with health care. Um, funding school like funding the schools, like actually fund funding and resourcing the schools, mentorship programs, hands down, paying for college. Like these are obviously like bigger things, right? But these are really important things. Um, and defunding the police, getting them out of schools, um, getting them out of schools and decriminalizing sex work. Like those are like major things that all play into this issue that we're talking about now. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit, um we were talking earlier about the like how can the school system show up and and like how can we as a community show up um and i think you all have done a really great job of like out outlining the things um that we can do i think teach like on a base level like teaching consent and practicing saying no um like that's huge. I think um, girls and kids in general are taught that we have to be small and and agree to things and like saying no is not really in our vocabulary. So learn like practicing saying no is huge. Um, bodily autonomy goes right into that. Like if they don't want to if they don't want to give a hug, you know, don't let it, don't have to, don't make them give a hug. Um, again, get cops out of schools. And then 
like I cannot express the like decrim of sex work enough because it's like it it the stigma that there is around sex work only goes to bolster this carceral state that is white supremacy and capitalism and like protecting the one percent and protecting um the white supremacist culture and sexist culture that we currently live in um so like the decriminalization of sex work to me is huge in moving forward in a lot of in a lot of these directions thank you and that's a that's that's a harder, heavier lift because decriminalization is about perception and that's really about narrative building, right? That's about creating a broad narrative that uh, shifts the dynamic of how we perceive the entire industry. Um, so if I could chime in here, ladies, I agree with everyone's point. Um, uh, if I could wake up in a perfect world tomorrow, I think that it would look like something where schools and different organizations in the community create something for girls just like how young men have these trade schools where they can get practical skills and if they don't want to commit to something like a four-year degree they have another route where they can you know create a striving career doing something else uh, if, even if they're unsure they can experiment Aside from that, I think there could be more done for young women and their mental health. I think in the black community, uh, mental health is something we don't talk about much, but if these kids at a young age are dealing with all these problems at home and low socioeconomic status is having a toll on them, it takes a mental toll as well. So I feel like we can be there for them in that sense. And I also think that, you know, more women could be stepping up as mentors, leaders, and role models, and give these women, you know, something else to look up to other than what they see in the media and on TV. And, you know, it's in real life, so they feel like it's more attainable. And, you know, just be a better support for women overall by being there for them and being present. I'm sorry, I was muted. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I've got a few questions that will kind of calm our conversation down, um, hopefully a little bit. So, uh, you know, we've got a really, really important election coming up. Um, it's the prosecutor election. We all have to go out and vote August 4th. Um, get informed about the issues, get informed about the candidates, and make a decision based on our values. Um, what role does our prosecutor play in, um, in this dynamic? Parker, would you like to answer that? Will you repeat the question one more time for me? Yeah, what what role does our prosecutor play in all of this? Oh, that is a good question. Um, well, the prosecutor is not someone who can write law. Um, they're not a legislator, right? But they do make the ultimate decision after someone has been um, booked with something, whether or not they're going to get charged with something. Um, and like what their punishment is going to be. And so I think as it regards to, as it regards like the decriminalization of, of sex work and addressing um, trafficking, which is a real problem um, and, and different than, than the issues we're facing with, with sex work, um, but they do go hand in hand. Um, our, I'm having a hard time like not saying the names <laughs> of people, um, but our prosecutor, like Wayne County prosecutor. We appreciate can decide, you acknowledging that this is a C3 space. Thank you. C3 <laughs> space. Um, so yeah, so uh, the prosecutor will make the ultimate decision of who gets prosecuted and look at the whole story. And so it is important that we have a prosecutor that takes the time to see that um, whether or not someone is doing a form of work 
um, for the resources and, and like if they acknowledge that sex work is work and not necessarily criminal, it, it harms no one. Um, and like actually punish or criminalize or like prosecute, hence, hence the name prosecutor, um, and prosecute folks who are actually doing harm, right? Uh, our laws are supposed to be there to protect us, not to criminalize people who are just trying to get by in capitalism, whatever way they choose to do that. Our laws are there to protect us from harm um, in theory. And, and so if the, pro the prosecutor can go after like people who are trying to get 15 year olds into the club, like promoting to get 15 year olds into the club, people who are, um, like violently coercing people or getting people to do things that they don't want to do in the industry, uh, rather than the people who are voluntarily choosing to be in the industry and trying to do it in a safe manner. Yeah. Can I add to that a bit? Please. Um, I just also want to reinforce that um, the prosecutor doesn't exist in a bubble. Um, the prosecutor submits a budget to the Wayne County Commission the Wayne County Commission is the one that approves that budget, as well as the budget for all of our county courts. Um, the prosecutor works closely with our police force, both, both um, the county sheriff, as well as city police within the county. Um, the prosecutor can have influence over certain priorities within these various departments. The prosecutor can have influence over special programming that happens within these departments, um, such as programming that um, better investigates rape, for example, and that um, takes a person-centered approach to rape victims, um, as opposed to investigations that treat women um, who say they have been raped as if they are lying from jump, right? Like these kinds of things, even though it happens in a police department, it can change with the influence of a particular prosecutor. Um, and so, like, yes, in terms of procedure, um, police arrest someone, then they bring a charge to a prosecutor and really the prosecutor staff, so who they hire really matters also. Um, and then they look at it and say, okay, um, yes, it's a misdemeanor or yes, it's a felony or actually it's this or no, they're gonna take that yes, they take that but also the county prosecutor has a lot of influence and is directly connected to the judges of the county courts and the police system, period. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing, Misha. Uh, does anybody else want to touch on what role the prosecutor plays in this dynamic? To catch you up, uh, Sis Mazzani, we, um, we talked a little bit about solutions and I was taking notes while people were talking. So we talked about mentoring, the creation of a, a large scale job center, um, parent involvement in the school. We talked about advocacy laws that could support um, opportunities for um, children. Did you, did you have, or, or people who are transitioning out? What's, Can what, you say that one more time? I didn't hear what you said. I, I heard it, but I, I, my, the words weren't really like connecting. I couldn't hear it like the way I was trying to like yeah. process it. So I know you wanted, I wanted to give you a chance to touch on a topic that we had almost moved away from, which was what are the solutions? And um, we talked about mentoring. We talked about large scale, uh, economically well-paid job creation. We talked about uh, parent involvement in the school system. And we talked about changing certain laws, but I, I wanted to tap you in or, or anybody, like what systems were there to support your uh, transition out of the lifestyle? How, how did that um, happen for you all? Um, for those of you who are out, I don't want to make assumptions. Well, so I'm out and I literally only had one person to lean on and she was in the industry before, you know, um, me or whatever, but then things kind of got to a space where it was like, um, you have to be responsible for wanting to stay out and be out. Like you have to, you have to be responsible for your own exit strategy. Like you can't, 
really like we can create all of these different conversations around exiting out but until someone wants to completely leave they won't leave um you can create opportunities you can create laws you can create everything but the reality of things is that like it's easy to go into the club and make a certain amount of money versus having to actually work and then you have a lot of people that are 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 looking for a trade i would say the most important thing to do while you are in the industry is to pick up a trade pick up a trade do nails do hair do makeup i think if, if we create a, a way of linking a trade to <laughs> um an exit it'll be more feasible to say i'm gonna lean back on this and you know you have to have that conversation of like okay well i may not make the same amount of money that i made but i'm gonna make a decent amount i have to come down i think that financial literacy is literally one of the only things that we lack that is necessary everything else is not necessary but financial literacy is necessary i'm one of those people who is not financially literate of many things. And because you don't value money when you're in there, you don't know how to control yourself when you're out of it. So going, like, you know, we've all seen Players Club and you have the conversation of like, well, make the money, don't let it make you. But the money does make you. It makes you live a certain lifestyle. It makes you look at things and people and put things and people in perspective. It makes you accustomed to a certain lifestyle. So when you when you have these conversations, we have to be realistic and understanding that we either can talk about prevention or we can talk about exit. And I think it's easier to talk about prevention than it is to talk about exit because exit is based upon the person. There is no one way exit strategy. Exit is based upon the person. Exit is based upon the person and what they desire. A lot of people don't don't desire anything different. So if we can, if we're gonna talk about solutions, it's gonna have to be preventative solutions. You know, um, finding out what this person, what, they're a year in. Mm-hmm. What do you like to do? Maybe create some kind of advocacy for me versus advocacy when you're exiting. That's that's for me. Okay. Thank you for sharing. I'm really glad that Masani brought up financial literacy because I, I see, I think we probably have all been part of or seen the conversation about you know, they should te- teach taxes in school instead of algebra, right? Like there's like that sound bite that floats all over the place, right? And so one thing I'll say is that I, I disagree with that because algebra is about teaching logic and critical thinking, which is a very specific mindset that helps you um, learn to address any number of other problems. But more than that, um, you know, we talked about equitable school funding before. And so I think it's important to note that like in this moment, um, our schools are fighting for the funding to provide the basics, right? So if we're saying that the basic responsibility, let's say literacy and math, right? And we also, and now we have like career training and trades as well, right? So if we say that like these are the basics, um, that's, we're not even funded the way that we should be for that especially given the needs of our students in our community where we're underfunded. And you can see the comparisons between like what Detroit schools are funded compared to what West Bloomfield schools are funded compared to Russ Point schools. And it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous disparity. Then you layer on top of it that schools are expected to be um, hubs for social support and for things like financial literacy and things like taxes. And I'm not saying that schools should not teach that. What I'm saying is that to the question of what kind of change do we demand, it is funding for the basics plus. It is rethinking how we fund schools entirely. If we're going to make schools, especially in our urban centers, responsible for things like laundry, right? Like there was a story about schools in Baltimore. They, They raised grant dollars to put a laundry room in the school because that's what their students needed, right? When we talk about, um, financial literacy in in depth to 
taxes to because it's not balancing a checkbook anymore right like it's 20 it's 2020 it's, it's not balancing the checkbook but it is like if you're an independent contractor like tracking your dollars knowing how to pay taxes which is important so that you didn't have access to unemployment or have access to um you know covid support through the government because they have to have a record of your taxes right so there's a number of people who are cut out of that entirely because they didn't follow this whole thing so if you're gonna be demand, like we can demand equitable funding, we can advocate for equitable funding for schools, and we can also advocate for rethinking how our schools are funded entirely. Like, you know, the need is there. Schools do need to provide these different kinds of services. Schools do need to be hubs in ways that they did not need to be 50 years ago. And so like, we need to rethink the ways in which we fund them so that we can actually provide those services um, at a, at a, and, and high quality services, not some little rinky dink room, you know, where the paint is peeling, like real services, a real center where students can learn the things that they need to learn for life. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question, uh, thinking about uh, all of our work from a criminal justice framework, what role do the police play in, in criminalizing uh, sex workers? And how do we... I'll speak on this one um, a little bit. They play a huge role. Um, the police play a huge role in the criminalization of anything because um, automatically we see them as the enforcers of the law right um but their role is always so interesting because i remember you know seeing certain officers frequent certain you know bars and not really yes in police uniform but not really acting like a police officer you know really and that kind of creates, you know, there, there we have again, those double standards and those weird, you know, dynamics. Um, you, there, there have been, I also want to speak. I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but there have been headlines about police officers who uh, can legally have sex in order to like incriminate sex workers. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm talking about specific. that. We need to. Um, we I'm, need to get these I'm, yes, I'm talking about. Okay, well, that's where we at. So I'm talking about. Yes, I'm talking about entrapment. I'm talking about police officers coming into spaces, um, sometimes in uniform, sometimes in not, um, posing as customers. Um, quite frankly, I have always been careful about the individuals that I deal with. Um, so I'm very good at screening individuals, but I've had multiple. Um, colleagues and friends and sisters of mine who have fell victim, unfortunately, to this type of behavior. And I remember talking to them about these experiences and it's just, you know, they're like, I didn't really know, you know, what to do, you know, because we are then who has a certain level of power or authority over you and who can alter, who is ultimately holding your freedom in their hands. Sometimes you don't really know, you know, like how you should respond or, you know, like what you should say. And then again, speaking to the fact that a lot of us didn't know or don't know what our laws are, you know, what are our rights? What should we be saying in these situations, you know? So then when we talk about when are the police called in two situations, you know, inside of clubs or when it comes to sex work, um, it's oftentimes when there's been a discrepancy um, that is fueled from something else. So I feel like strip clubs aren't going anywhere, right? So I feel that there should be certain things in place, you know, that there, if, if you're going to have this type of establishment, you should have certain structures and certain things in place, you know, like people get nervous when you start talking about the police, you know, and if you have a young lady, um, I've witnessed multiple overdoses in the industry. And if you have a young lady who is battling with something so tough that she is trying to escape in such a way that she has decided to overdose on the job, 
that's not necessarily, in my opinion, you shouldn't be calling the police to drag this woman out of here. She's incoherent. You know, like we should be trying to, should be some type of medical professional. Or, you know, it's just like when we're talking about um, dealing with situations in the schools. You know, the first thing we want to do is call the police. And then we get into over-policing of just all types of industries. Just the police just don't have to be a part of every single um, every single situation. Like, there are so many other ways to de-escalate a situation. But oftentimes, we don't even try those. We hop straight to the police. You know, we don't even try to um, mediate or try to figure out the route. It's like, like, oh, a fight broke out, call the police, you know, or, you know, like something is wrong, you know, like call the, call, call the authorities. And I think that that's a huge, that's a huge disconnect in another place where we're failing each other. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I want to say something based on, you said uh, the young ladies and, and the drugs and the things of that nature. Again, we have to, because what, what this panel was about, was about the youth you know what i'm saying so i don't want to get so riled up about adults making adult decisions you know i want to i want to you know give everyone the ability to make their own choices you make a choice and you have a choice now when we speak of trafficking the choices are you know the options of choices are removed but when you have a choice you're then having to take accountability for these choices so you know i don't like i said i i'm here for the for the for the space for the youth but i absolutely do believe that the police should be called you have like there's a certain level of uh danger that you put yourself and other people in you know you don't know the reactions that are going to happen from this person who is used you know so i i don't want to demonize the police in this in this conversation but i also do understand yeah there are some times where they don't have to be called but i do feel like if someone is overdosing you call 911 because if not, then the police are, are called and the clubs are shut down. So now a whole club full of girls are out of work because the club is shut down. Yeah, Saida. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, anybody else want to share their opinion? I know the police have been a hot topic lately. I'd be, I'd be interested in sharing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, again, there's just so many, so many things at play. Um, the question, the original question was, what role do the police play? Um, and I think there's, I mean, there's so many things about the police. It's like, there is stigma against all sex workers. And so we are treated as less than. Um, I have friends who've been like pulled over speeding coming home late at night from the strip club and were sexually assaulted by a police officer because the police officer knew they could get away with it. Um, and, and sex workers are just seen as like less than human. Um, the criminalization of sex work on the whole makes it, makes sex workers um, more vulnerable. Uh, again, this like an entrapment thing. I think entrapment and like that practice of that practice period is uh, a waste of tax dollars. Like, why are we, why are we paying a police officer to do that? That just seems like an absolute waste. Um, I, there's a, an incredible power dynamic at play um, because your life is like your your future is in their hands, like being arrested. Um, and even like the presence of, of police at the, the club was just like super oppressive. There was a power dynamic there. Um, and I think there are, I mean, in this call to defund the police, 
there are other structures that we can put into play that will de-escalate situations, help to provide the resources that people are seeking, and all of these, all of these things. So I think that um, the police play a significant role, and they should, they just shouldn't. Like there's, we don't need them there for a lot of things. Um, Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, so we've reached the end of my questions. Um, somebody from our comments said on Instagrams, there are a lot of girls slash women that show a pretty face and there are men and women who say, who respond to them by saying, where do you strip at? And the response is, I don't strip. And some of them become strippers. Um, so you know, that was another thought that felt important to add on, like the social media pressure. Are there any uh, final thoughts uh, coming from the panelists, change that you would like to see, points that you don't feel were raised? Um, uh, that sounds like a no. This is a juicy conversation. Well, I could have been a panelist myself because I wanted to talk about molestation and how. Yeah, I was. I was. I was going to say something. Um, I, I know I got I'm, I'm, my phone died for a second, but and I don't know what I missed. Um, but what I would like to speak about is, um, you know, Parker, you said that at six years old you were unable to be a child. You know what I'm saying? So like when i was saying the preventative measures what do you who how who do you feel failed you you know what i'm saying like how can we go into that space of what happened to you you know because i know what happened to me i was influenced so i take accountability for my influence but at six years old with that being your statement mom i want to be a stripper who who do you feel failed you and what would you say to six-year-old you who would you want six-year-old you to have? That's a powerful question. Thank you for asking it. Yeah, that's an incredible question. And I think there's so many things. I think uh, like ultimately, um, to like to be clear, I, I was a sex worker, like I was a stripper. I enjoyed being a stripper, except for like a lot of the external uh, BS that is put on being a stripper. Like I, I enjoyed the act of dancing. I, um, I learned a lot. Um, and I am currently a sex worker. And, um, so like, that's, that's where I'm coming from. I think my desire to be a stripper was like this desire to, um, I think the issue of like the part I'm trying to raise of, of not being able to be a kid, it goes beyond six years old. Six years old, I just wanted to be like flashy on the stage, dancing, looking pretty, right? Like my six-year-old brain, that's what I was thinking. Um, but as I got older, I, there wasn't space for me to have like a childlike existence to like, it was this like in the media we see like adult women there's no there's no room there's no space there's no place for um kids and and like even at school like yeah I'm doing the school thing but there's this like idea that you're gonna you're you're growing up you're doing the thing now so that you can grow up and be this thing um uh, instead of just like I am 14 or 12 or 10 and like I want to go do this thing um I want to go play in the dirt I want to go like do whatever it is there's this push to become women so quickly because women like girls in the way that I like the way it was in my head at least because I'm going to speak from an I statement um the way I felt it in my in my being was like I don't I'm not valued as a kid, as a girl, but I'm valued as a woman, a sexual like woman. That's where I have value. So I think to answer your question, what failed me is like societally, we need to value our girls. Our girls are non-binary folk, like kids, our trans kids, like we need to value 
our kids and give them space to be kids instead of like push them to become adults and workers so quickly. I hope that answered that question. Um. I just, I really appreciate you saying that. And it's another area that I think schools have a lot of responsibility because like your kids in school for hours of the day, right? And so like the expectations we have around adults and allowing, like you, you expect a school to be a space where a kid can be a kid, right? But I think we all know that like socially we, <laughs> We got folks who look at toddlers and say, what you doing, you flirting, right? Or, oh, is that your little girlfriend, right? And like, it seems harmless. And I get why it seems harmless, but it also reinforces the way that we're thinking about things in our minds and our kids do absorb those things. Even if you're thinking like toddlers don't remember, okay, but we're now practicing that language. We're now practicing teasing kids in that way. And then we continue to tease kids in that way. And then, you know, as they gain more exposure, as they grow further, as they start to hit puberty, now that kind of language takes on new meaning. Now it takes on an impact in how they see themselves, how they think about their identities, how they think about their values, like you just said, Parker. And so I, I just, you know, think that schools and the ways in which we work with our teachers and our staff and you know, the kinds of language we expect to see within a building or the ways in which we expect teachers to socialize and, and staff overall, again, because kids interact with a lot of different adults in a school building and it's not just about teachers. So like the ways in which we set expectations around how adults interact with kids, it can seem really far removed from like these more traumatic issues we're discussing, but it all like, it all builds up, right? And that's why like, looking at it from this like youth development perspective is so important because like how we internalize our feelings, how we start thinking about stuff, how we like see the world um, leads into like all the different things that we're able to interact with. And that's before you are faced with the issue of someone actively harming you, right? Um, because we know that there are lots of young girls who are being assaulted who are being molested and then that has a whole other impact on how you see your sexuality and your body. So even, but even before that impact of trauma, there are all these other ways that like we have to have higher standards um, and more thoughtful standards as adults for how we interact with kids. Like you don't mean any harm and, and that's fair, um, but we gotta examine ourselves and really peel it apart and take ownership over that. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that really, really important comment. I want you all, everybody that's watching, I want to thank the Facebook um, and IG audiences. Go follow our uh, Facebook. Check out our website. We're at forcedetroit.org um, and our IG and Live Free Detroit on um, and Live Free DET on IG and on Facebook. So uh, check us out, keep, keep in touch with us, reach out, volunteer. Our goal is to um, develop policy solutions, uh, particularly around human trafficking, which is one of the most insidious forms of this uh, work because it is uh, non-consensual. Um, but it, our ultimate goal is to make sure that everybody has just economic options um, and go vote on August 4th. Peace, y'all. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much. Peace.